right, all right. Welcome home, LifeSpring family. Thank you for coming. We are here to celebrate. Hey, if we could get you to move up, move in closer so the rest of the people can come in and fill in behind you, we'd like to welcome you here. Thank you for being a part of our service. If we want to welcome those virtually, we want to say hi. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our worship service. We are here. Let the band lead us in worship. We know that they have a great message here and lead us into the worship in the presence of God. All right, everybody stand up. Put your hands together this morning. We're going to celebrate. That's what we're here for today. Come on, sing with me. Nothing shall be 
did was stay still. The Lord says today that I'm looking for a generation who will stand up and step out and have a spirit of boldness, have a spirit of boldness like David did. I'm looking for worshipers to stand up and step out and it's time to come out of the tent. It's time to come out of the tent and slay the giant. I'm looking for a generation of worshipers who will not hide in the tent of fear, who will not hide in the tent of excuses, but will stand up and step out and pick up the stone of boldness and put it in the sling, that will speak out against the giant, that will speak out against the world, that will speak out and speak and stand up for what the truth is that's declared in my word. I'm also looking for a generation to pick up the second stone and it's a stone of purpose and have I not given you purpose you are not an accident you are not uh, something that just happened I have a plan and a purpose for you and just as David came to serve his king just as David came to serve his brothers just as David came to serve his country and to stand up and to serve me I am calling you to serve and have a spirit of purpose about you but yes I'm calling you to pick up the third stone as David picked up five smooth stones I'm calling you to pick up the third stone and that is the stone of faith that is the stone of faith that is the stone of faith because it took boldness to face the giant it took boldness to put the rock in the sling and twirl it around it took purpose and servant attitude to show up but yay I'm looking for someone who will run at the giants who will run at the giant and let go of the stone and throw the stone I have won the battle already I will do the fighting the battle belongs to me when when the, my son died on the cross I, I won the battle when I shed when his blood was shed, the battle was won. The battle is already won. The giants are already defeated. I'm just looking for a group of worshipers who will rise up and run at the giant in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sing praise. So praise will be. My song becomes my triumph, and worship is.
are seated this morning, turn and greet someone around you. If you don't know them, introduce yourself to them. Welcome home, Life Spring Church. It's so good to see smiling faces. That's so awesome to me. I, I know when I when I come home and stuff, it just you see the smiling faces of people when you get home. I, I think about that every time I come to church. Thank you for, for being here. If it's your first time here, uh, thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here. Please scan this QR code. We're going into the new age. We can scan this code, and you can uh, fill out a little Connect card. If you've never filled out a Connect card, scan that. It's how we connect with you. It's, we can get some information from you, and we can be a part. If you don't know, LifeSpring is a family. Amen? Amen. 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 This is a, it's a place where we can find God, find freedom, find purpose, and make a difference. Amen. No matter where you're at in your life, one of those four things can, can be a part of your life. You're either finding God, finding freedom, finding purpose, or making a difference. Amen? Amen. Hey, uh, also one last thing. There's, there's another QR code, so get your phones out. If you want to be a part of a small group or you're connected with some type of small group, scan the QR code again. It gives you our calendar. It lets you know what's going on this week. We have, diff we have all different small groups. We have singles. We have college. We have couples. We have all different small groups meeting. So please scan it, let you know you don't show up at the wrong time or not show up when you think, oh, I missed, I missed out on that group this week. So please scan that. Everybody say next week. What's going on next week? Mother's Day. Yes, Mother's Day. It's going to be a great time. So please invite your mothers, your sisters, your daughters, your aunts, your cousins. We want to celebrate women next week, and we want to lift them up and praise them next week. Amen? Amen. So as a church, we are a tithing church. We believe in tithe as a, as a staff, as a church, as everything. We are a, a tithing church. A lot of people don't know what a tithe is. A tithe is 10% of your income. Now, that 10% isn't going to me, and it isn't going to Rex. That tithe is going to the church, and then back out into the community. It's how we can be the church. Jesus called us to be the church. That is what we do. We are the church. And so we can be a blessing as the church. I know there's a hundred different stories in here of how God's blessed us. A lot of times, before I tithe, I thought, man, I can't afford to tithe. I can't, I can't do it. Now I think I can't afford not to tithe because of the blessings that God has poured out over my life and over my finances. So I challenge you, if you're not tithing, if you think, man, I can't afford it, I, I put it out there in faith and he will show up over and over and over again. Amen. There's a couple ways to give. We can give in the bucket, check, uh, cash or check, or you can scan again. Bring out your phones, put it up there, scan again, and it'll, it'll take you right to a link that you can give. Let's pray over them. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you. Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for allowing us to serve you, to worship you, to praise you, Lord God. Lord, I pray a, a prayer of blessing over the gift and the giver today, Lord God. I pray that you will show up in their finances, and there will be no doubt that it is you who has showed up. And Lord, and that, that you will take their 90% and make it 150%, because you, your math, works out so much better than ours, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Well, let's give a round of applause for our lead pastor. I get to call him my friend and my lead pastor. Thank you so much. We give him honor and praise today. How about we give it to God? That's a, that's a one. Amen. Hey, it's, a, it's so good to see everybody here today. In case you don't know, in case you're just tuning in online, uh, my wife, my beautiful wife up here, Amy, and I have had the honor and privilege of pastoring this church for 11 years. Can you believe it? Church, we're 11 years old. And um, God has given the privilege to, to uh, basically gather a great family today. So again, we want to say welcome home. And this is a place where our prayer and our honest desire is that you find God, if you've already found, if you've already found him, that you find more of God. Yes, how many of you know yes. God has so much for you and that you find purpose and that you find freedom and that you make a difference? You know, God didn't just create us to be insignificant. There's somebody that you have that's a friend, that's a loved one, that you know that God is going to use you 
Do you receive this? God is going to use you to make a difference in their lives. God is going to use you like David, like we spoke about before. Amen. So I just want to lead us in prayer for the word. Lord, thank you this day that you've created. We're so, uh, Lord, glad like David. We rejoice in it. And we thank you for the miracles you have planned, the blessings, Lord, everything you have planned in this day. We thank you for it and we rejoice in it. And we give you glory and we give you honor as we set aside all distractions. Speak to us today, Lord. Let us learn from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And, and so I want to uh, launch a brand new series that I think is so critically important. Because all of us come from a family of sorts. Uh, all of us have or had a father and a mother. And uh, doesn't matter how that all worked out in your earthly family. God has a spiritual family. Can, can, can you say that with me? God has a spiritual family. We call ours life spring. Uh, but there's a lot of great spiritual families around. And we want to invite you to be a part of this great spiritual family. Some of you already are. But if you haven't uh, plugged in to Live Spring Church, please, please be a part of our family. We're inviting you. We're inviting you. We would say to our Indonesian sister, Selamat pagi, right? We would say to our uh, Spanish brothers and sisters, Buenos dias. We would say to our uh, Japanese sister over here, Ohio, that right there. I'm still learning. <laughs> I'm still learning Japanese. But the point is, we're a multicultural, multi generational church. We're not a white church. We're not a black church. We're not of this church. We're not of that church. We're God's church. And we want you all to be a part of our family. And so we have an earthly family and we have a spiritual family. So I want to uh, visit today, real quickly, about the first family. The first family ever on this earth. You know who that was? Adam and Eve and the broken family. We're call, calling it the broken family. Because whether or not we came from a broken family on this earth or not, we all came from a broken family because of Adam and Eve. And so I, I just want to share that. Because before the fall, Adam and Eve were in a perfect relationship with God. Do we understand that? Yeah. Adam and Eve were in a perfect relationship with God. And we read that in Genesis 1 and 2. And then in Genesis 3, we see that the fall happened, right? So in, in, in just a few moments, we went from a perfect family that would have been descended on down into a broken family. And so we all inherit some of that spiritual DNA. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. We're all born broken. And, but I have good news. God is the fixer. God can repair, repair the breach. God can heal the wounds. God can, I love that song and it gets me every time. When I thought I lost me, and when, I, when, I, when I left me, you, you came back and you found me, something like this. You see why I'm not the worship leader. Right? And you put all the pieces together. I have to have the Christian karaoke up there to do it right. I, I, have, to, I have to see the words. But uh, it, it's a great song. So, I just want to uh, share a scripture, Ephesians 2, about spiritual family. Now, all of us, can you say all of us? All of us. So not just the Bible days, not just before then. It's talking about right now today. All of us can go to the Father. Aren't you thankful for that? Through Christ, and, and, and Hebrews says we can do it. We can come to the throne in, in boldness. We can come before the Father, and we can come to the Father through Christ by way of the Holy Spirit. There's the Trinity right there. All together, the Godhead three in one. From now on, you're not strangers. There's no such thing as strangers. In fact, the, the book of Galatians 3 says, there's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. There's neither uh, you know, a servant or, or a master. In other words, in Christ, in God's kingdom, we're all equal. There's no favorites. And he says, so you're not strangers or people who are not citizens. You are citizens together with those who belong 
to God. How many of you belong to God this morning? You belong. Therefore, if you belong to God, you belong in God's family. So I'm going to talk about spiritual family. And in fact, I want to introduce you to one of our great new families. We just had a uh, little challenge over the past three weeks that was. Benito, Benito, come on up. Come on up here. They're both named Benito, so they can both come up here. Come on up here, Benito. That's, that's Benito and Benito Jr. Benito, I want you to pick out the TV. You've already picked one out. We've been talking. And so here's a check to cover the cost of the TV. God bless you, and thank you so much. And keep on inviting, Benito. We honor you today. God bless you. And just to show you that this is a real thing about spiritual family, that we do life together and stuff like that, we just went to Charleston, South Carolina this past week and went to a pastor's conference. I wanted to learn how to be a better pastor, right? And we, and we took some of the staff. So, it's <laughs> the answer to my son's prayer. So, so just take a look at this, this picture. Now, keep in mind, this picture was stretched out. We're, we're not all this fat, although, <laughs> although we did have some good food. But that's, that's the famous pineapple fountain in church. Yeah, I know. It stretched us out, I promise. I mean, you can look at the people. They're not like just, you know. But uh, anyway, that we had fun at, right there at the pineapple fountain. And then look at these four monkeys. Look at this. There's, there's hear no evil. And, and there's see no evil, and then on the end there's speak no evil, and I'm have no fun. So, you know, <laughs> the four monkeys of Charleston were uh, out there uh, doing their thing. So, anyway, but we, the good thing about a small church is that we can. Yeah. You know what? You can. You can text the pastor. You can call the pastor. You can invite me to lunch and buy my lunch. <laughs> Look, look. I mean, I like it. Or I can buy your lunch. So we're, we're, we're a great family here. So I want to uh, jump into the first family and to show you that we all inherit that spiritual DNA from the first family. Uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Because as I said, before the fall, it was a perfect relationship, but then Adam and Eve messed it up. In fact, I was at a funeral one time. And the guy was uh, grieving over his mother, and he said, Mama, he said, you beat me to heaven, but I want you to do me a favor. When you get there, I mean, when, now that you're there, give Jesus a big old kiss, and then go over to Adam and punch him in the mouth. <laughs> that was the Christian way of saying that. He said something a lot worse, but <laughs> it's a family show. So Genesis 3 now the serpent was more cunning than the any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And watch what he does. He's, he hasn't changed his tricks. Watch what the devil does. He said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You know, if you, if you read some of the internet and read some of the atheist blogs and agnostic, you know what they do? The Bible's not true. The Bible's just a bunch of fairy tales. The Bible's just a bunch of myths. But how many of you know, we know, the Bible is the way, the truth, the life. The Bible is the truth. And there's even archaeological evidence that proves the Bible is truth. There's even historians that prove Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected on the third day and was on this earth. Not, not, it's in the Bible, but it's also recorded by secular history. The Bible is true it's not a myth it's not a fairy tale and it's for you and i it's alive i've read all kinds of books but none of them have ever spoken to my heart like this one amen, amen. and so he challenged the word and, and the woman said to the serpent well we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden all the all the trees but she said there's one in the middle that god has said don't eat it or you, you nor touch it lest you die and so then the devil challenged the word again and said, oh, you're not going to die. And, and you may think, well, Adam and Eve ate of this fruit and they didn't die. 
but they did. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're all spiritually dead, that our spirits are dead until we meet Jesus and He is the resurrection and the life. And once we get saved, we become alive. So they did die spiritually. And for God knows that in that day you eat of, eat of it, he, the devil said, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, watch this, and it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And so I've heard men say this before. Yeah, it's all Eve's fault we're in this situation. Nope. Look, Adam was standing right there, and had Adam been doing his job as a man and as a covenant husband, he would have stepped in there and said, get out of my house, devil, right? Now, see, that's, all the women are clapping for that one, yeah. She, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her. He was standing right there the whole time, and he ate. And so, uh, I, and then I want to go to the New Testament, and show you something in 1 John chapter 2. The Bible says, for all that's in the world, you can trace every sin down to these three roots or trunk, these, this twisted trunk of the tree. You name the sin, it can be taste, traced down to these three. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So let's go back to that Genesis 3, 6 back one slide back and you see that so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food lust of the flesh that it was pleasant to the eyes lust of the eyes and desirable to make one wise the pride of life there all three of them are right there she took and ate and so every sin can be traced down but because of this fall because of this disobedience the world changed and three things entered into the world. And every time we become disobedient, and every time we step out of God's plan, and every time we sin, this is what we experience. And see if you can follow along with me. The first one is shame. The first one is shame. How many of you have ever done something that you just felt, you know, the Holy Spirit convicted you? Now, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit convicting you and shame. And we're going to cover that. But let's look at how Adam and Eve experienced shame. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. How did they know that they were naked? How did they know? Did the monkey say, <laughs> or, you know, no. They knew because all of a sudden their eyes, their spiritual eyes were opened, and all of a sudden they're naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. This is what we do when we sin too, isn't it? We first get shame and then we hide. Yeah. Remember Achan that took the wedge of gold that he wasn't supposed to take? What did he do? He said, I saw it, I took it, and I hid. Yeah. Hiding is the result of shame. And so the Lord, the, they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Man, if we only knew what the presence of the Lord is all about. If we only knew that the presence of the Lord brings mercy. That the presence of the Lord brings grace. That the presence of the Lord brings forgiveness. We don't have to live in shame. And they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called, Adam, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. You know what this reminds me of when he said that? I was afraid, I was naked, and I hid myself. It reminds me of my three-year-old grandson, Camden. Because Camden will start, like, he'll do something like, <coughs> and then he'll say, I am coughing. Like, you figured that one out, Sherlock, you know. But he's just so innocent. And, and, and Adam says, I, I, was, I, I heard your voice, and, and I, I, was, I was naked and, and afraid, so I hid myself. And God knew where he was all the time. God knew what he did. Yeah. And he goes on to say, who told you 
that you were naked. Have you eaten from the tree? God knew. It's like when you ask a kid, did you take that cookie? And they're like, remember Brennan? He couldn't lie. I don't think he still can lie. Very, he, he cocked his mouth aside and said, no, I didn't eat that cookie. But you knew he ate the cookie, right? God knew. God knew, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? So they, they had a sense of shame. But, but God has something to take care of our shame. God has something to take care of it. And Hebrews teaches us that the covering for shame or the way God takes care of shame and the way God takes care of our sins is through bloodshed. So watch what God does. Maybe you never thought about this. But if you look in verse 20 of Genesis 3, or 21, it says, And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God, he said, Take off those fig leaves. He made tunics of skin and clothed them. Why did he give them animal skin to wear? We still wear leather shoes today, right? Why did he give them animal? Because there had to be bloodshed for the sacrifice of sins. He was already establishing a precedent. And so he gave them the tunics of skin and clothed them. And to, to back this up, uh, look at G Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. And you see the symbolic form of it. It says, I counsel you to buy from me gold and re uh, refine in the fire. It's not talking about literal gold. Revelation is highly spiritually symbolic. It's talking about spiritual riches that God wants to give us gold and treasure spiritually. And that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed. Why? That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. In other words, God has a plan for us to cover our shame in our spiritual nakedness. Isaiah 61 puts it like this in the Old Testament. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has what? Clothed me with garments of salvation. And he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. Aren't you thankful for that? And it's not our righteousness that we clothe ourselves with. It's his righteousness that we clothe ourselves with. And because he shed his blood on the cross, there is a sacrifice for our sins and our shame. Aren't you thankful? In fact, let's just take a survey right now. How many of you, you are saved, you belong to God, but at some point in your life, you messed up? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. Now, look, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you've messed up after you've been saved. Now, thank you for both hands up, Randy. I see both of those hands. I'm a pastor. I see. Keep the hands up. Now, everybody look around. Look how many sinners are at Live Spring Church. <laughs> All right, you can put your hands down. But God doesn't expect us, and he knows we can't. That's why he had the law. Nobody could fulfill the law except for Jesus Christ. Nobody can be perfect. Nobody can live the perfect life. He wants us to try to be righteous, but we live in his righteousness. And uh, because the devil will try to beat you up. The devil will try to get in your mind and say, oh, there you go again. You messed up again, and you got to say back to the devil, yeah, but devil, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. And every time I mess up, I come to the Father, and I say, God, forgive me. I missed it again, and your blood covers me, and he takes care of all my sin and shame. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. That's the God we serve. We don't have to ride our bike. We don't have to say 55 Hail Marys. We don't have to wear a special necklace. We don't have to throw water. We don't have to burn incense. We don't have to do anything. All we have to do is come to Christ and say, I need you. He wants relationship with us. So shame is the first one. And, you know, as a pastor, I like everything to, so you can remember it. So the next one is blame. Blame. Look at Genesis 3.11 as we continue on in the passage. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And, and the man said, now watch this. Talk about shame. Now we're talking about blame. Adam gets a twofer right here. Watch what he does. The woman you gave me. You hear that? Have you ever blamed God for something? Did you hear that? The woman that you gave me. It's not my fault, God. 
if you hadn't given me this woman, it would have never happened. And, you know, she did it anyway. You know, don't we do that? Don't we do that? We, 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 we point at everybody. It, it's, it's their fault. No. No. It's right here. But, she, but he said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. We go from shame into blame. Well, I would, um, I would do a little better in my walk with God, but I would uh, pray a little bit more, but I would get into the word, but, I mean, come on, I know I'm, I'm hitting some low blows here. Preach. Preach. But, the, you know, this or that, the woman you gave me. And then, watch as, as it continues on. Then the Lord said to the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the devil made me do it. <laughs> That's where that phrase came from. The devil made me do it. You come home with an expensive pair of shoes. What have you done, woman? The devil made me do it. You know, the devil made me do it. And then, and then this is funny to me, and I'm going to ask God this question. So the Lord went to the devil, and he said, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle. What did the cattle do? <laughs> I'm going to ask God one day, God, what did the cattle do? You left us hanging there. Come on, help us out here. And more than every beast of the field, it says. So we not only go into a period of shame, but we go into blame. I did this because, and point the finger. And, and, and if you want to see kind of a modern day word for blame, look at Revelation chapter 12, because we do this sometimes. You know another word for blame? Accusation. Accusing. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the, what? Accuser of our brethren yeah. who accuse them before God day and night has been cast down. You know what that tells me? Every time I blame someone for something or every time I point the finger or accuse, I'm doing the devil's work. Ouch. Because he's the accuser of the brethren. So it's time that I step up and say, you know what? I did it. As a covenant man... I take responsibility. I take responsibility for my family. I take responsibility for my actions. I take responsibility for my life. And I'm not going to blame this or that or this or that. I, I hear people sometimes say, well, you know, he grew up in a broken family. We all grew up in a broken family. And my mom and dad have been married for over 60 years. And, and you know, I don't, I don't see any kind of divorce or anything on the horizon. It's till death do they part. They've gone this far. They're going to ride that baby out, right? But I came from a broken family spiritually. They came from a broken family spiritually. We all have broken DNA in us. And so uh, we can choose to step up and take responsibility for our actions. Amen? So, but we all know it's Putin's fault. Everything. <laughs> That's my, I'm sorry if you, I should, did I say that? Did that come out out loud? No. I, I use that all the time. They're like, someone will say, well, the concrete is late. You know, it's not here. When it, you said 3 o'clock and the truck is late. Well, it's Putin's fault. You know that, right? Everything, everything's Putin's fault. These brakes are squeaky. Well, you know, that's Putin's fault, right? It's just kind of, it's just kind of a funny thing to say. You use that on your job when, when your boss or your, 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 uh, or your employees or your, or your customers come down on you to say, well, I'm sorry, it's Putin's fault. You know? <laughs> but I, just real quick on that, I, we, one time Amy and I went out of town and talking about blame, and I was on medication, okay? I have a confession to make. <laughs> I had some horrible back spasms, and I was taking this stuff that knocked me plumb out. There's two kind, I found out there's two kinds of muscle relaxers. One, it'll knock you out. It's, not, it's like a sleeping pill. It just it knocks you out. You forget you have a back. And you're just like, what? I thought it was Wednesday. No, it's Friday. And you're just out of it. 
And the other one, you can still kind of function and all that. I figured out now I can do the one that you function with. But this time, I was missing a shirt. And I said, Amy, where's that shirt? You know, what I was doing? I was blaming my wife. <laughs> my wife with a missing shirt and and I looked everywhere for it even under the mattress and everywhere I was you know wasn't all right in the mind and looked everywhere I could not find the shirt and that's what I did I said because our windows were open and there were lots of squirrels running around the tree and I said well you know maybe one of them squirrels got in here and took my shirt out and I actually blamed the squirrel because I figured out it wasn't my wife that took that shirt and I never did find that shirt on that trip, but when I got home, it was hanging up in my closet. So remember that next time we're tempted to blame, maybe right here. Shame, blame, and then the last one, it's got to rhyme, right? Fame. And the reason why I'm saying fame, it's not really fame, but it's as a desire that comes from insecurity to be recognized. The look at me, look at me, look at me. In, in, in Genesis 3.20, you see it? Genesis 14 through 19, God had just said, okay, uh, uh, you know, man, you're under a curse. Woman, you're under a curse. And serpent, you're under a curse. Above all the cattle, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And what does Adam do right off the bat? And by the way, we have to get our theology right. God doesn't ever curse anyone. What happens is God says the blessing is right here. The umbrella of blessing is right here. And we choose out of disobedience to go over here. Right. And God says the blessing is right here. So we're under a curse yeah. because we choose to step out of the blessing. Do we understand that? Yeah. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They chose to step out of the blessing that God had established. And if we just live by this, we're under the blessing and we're not yeah. under a curse. Yeah. And God destroyed all the curses on the cross. So don't let anybody tell you you're under a generational curse. Because if no matter what your pappy did and your grandpappy and the one before him and your father and all that, no matter what all that is, the blood of Jesus destroys every curse. Read the book of Galatians. And all I have to do is not do what my pappy and grandpappy and father, all that. I just live under this umbrella of blessing. Are you with me? And so, uh, so in Genesis 5, 2, what does Adam do? Remember, in Genesis 2, he said, you're bone of my bone. When, he, when, when Eve was created, we are one. You're bone of my bone. You're flesh of my flesh. And do you know what Eve's name was back then? I'm going to show you what it was. But in Genesis 5, 2, it says he created them male and female and bless them and call them you know what the hebrew word is for mankind adam or adam her name was adam they were one male and female they were both named adam but then he gets out and says your name from now on will be eve your name will be eve the mother of all life in other words after the fall and after sin created the separation between man and woman we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week but God's plan is for the two to become one and the Bible says we have a new name written in heaven one day I'm gonna find out what our name is babe I don't know what it is do you she probably does she's probably holding back on me <laughs> but Genesis 5 2 um, and, and, and Genesis 3.20, I mean, uh, wrapping up, Acts 3.25 says this, talking about spiritual family. You, everybody say you. you. Everybody say I. I. Are the family of the early preachers and the promise that God made with our early fathers. He said to Abraham, all, everybody say all. All, all the families of the earth, that's every single one receive God will receive God's favor through your children in other words you can be a part of the blessing of God in his spiritual family you receive that this morning as I, as I close out I want to talk a little bit more about this shame blame and 
and, and this desire for recognition that, that sin progresses us into. And there was a man back in the 1700s that lived in England, and his name was William Cowper. And if you ever see a, a picture of William Cowper, he looks like George Washington. So if you have a $1 bill, just look at, you know, the, the gray wig with the little flip-up curls. That's what William Cowper looked like. That was a very popular look back in the day. Kind of like back in the 80s when all the guys had a perm. You know, I, I had, I've got real curly hair, and I remember a pastor asking me one day, pulled me aside, he goes, hey man, where'd you get your perm at? Like, I don't have a perm, it's just, you know, that's my hair, you know, God gave me that perm, I guess. But this guy, William Cowper, he grew up uh, in a broken family, and he lived an immoral lifestyle. But he went to law school, and he was going to apply for uh, basically a, a position of a clerk to be in Congress. And he was excited about that. And he actually got saved and um, repented of his immoral lifestyle. But the devil started playing head games with him. And he started suffering from great shame from the way he used to live his life. He didn't understand the concept of grace and forgiveness and mercy. And it was just really tormenting him. And then to make matters worse, he found out to be in the Congress of England, which is called the House of Lords, it's like our House of Representatives, you have to go through a public examination where you have to stand before the entire Congress and they go over the playbook, play by play, of everything you've ever done. And they have witnesses come up. And the shame came over him and a, 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 a kind of an evil spirit came over him. And he decided that he was going to end his life. And listen, suicide is no joke. It's not, it, it's not funny. And if anybody is suffering from that same spirit, we can help you. We can help you because God says, I am life. Yes. And you can live the life and life more abundantly. But William Cowper decided to end his life. And he went up on a very high bridge in London. It might have been London Bridge. I don't know. But he got up to the top, and he was ready to jump, and he's afraid of heights. And he got scared, and so he went back down. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it that way. But on his way to his house, he stopped by a, a store and grabbed a bottle of poison. And on his way to his house, he dropped the bottle of poison, and it shattered all over the, the, the ground. And then he went into his house, and he said, I know how I'll end it. And he got a rope. And he flew it over the, the beam of his house and tied it around his neck. And he jumped off a chair and the beam of the house broke and he fell to the ground. And then he said, that, I can't, that's it. And he's just emotionally exhausted and he took a knife out of the kitchen and tried to thrust it into him and the blade broke. And he just was so emotionally drained. He went to the couch and fell asleep while he was asleep. While he was asleep, God spoke to him. And God revealed to him about forgiveness, about grace, about mercy, about how there is hope. And you can live a life of hope and blessing and forgiveness no matter what you've done in the past. Come on, somebody. And that the blood of Jesus covers all of our sins. And he woke up with a song in his heart and he went to the Congress or the House of Lords and he stood before the people and when they were about to start examining his life he said before you start I want you to know I have a terrible past I have messed up I have failed I have been immoral with many women and I, I have many sins in my life but by the grace of God I am saved in the blood of Jesus he, he covers all my sin, and I have no shame. And people got saved in Congress that day because of his testimony. And if we can stand to our feet, because I want to sing to you the song that William Cowper wrote. And you may have heard it before, and feel free to sing along with me. But it goes like this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from
that again, but I want you to step out of your comfort zone. I want you to step out and come up here and receive prayer. If you need prayer today for any reason, if there's anything going on in your life, please step out of your seat, step out of your comfort zone. Everybody needs prayer. Amen. Just come on up here and receive from God. Come on. He's covered all of our shame. He's covered all of our sins. The blood of Jesus covers all of our nakedness, if you will, spiritually. And God, God, God covers us. Let's sing it again as we worship and come on up for prayer this morning. As you guys pray for people this morning. The fountain Now sing the chorus, lose all their guilt and shame. Lose all their guilt and shame. Do you believe it this morning? Lose all their guilt and shame. Oh, and sinners much. There's some people that need prayer over here. to play. I want you to stay in an attitude of prayer. There's still those receiving ministry up here. And I want you to think about this, that the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, come on somebody, covers all, covers all, past, present, and future. It covers all of our sins. And we don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to live in shame. We don't have to listen to the devil because the blood of Jesus took care of every curse, took care of every sin, and takes care of it all. We thank you for it, Father. If you need prayer this morning and you're watching online, you can text the word prayer to 972-402-6456. We will have a staff member contact you and pray. Please don't hesitate. Please text that word in. God bless you this morning as we continue. And that is your prayer. i 
Bring everybody to church. It's going to be a great day. God bless you. Have a great week.